Hello, my name is Heather Etchevers. I'm a scientist at the Ex Marseille University in Marseille, France. I work as a researcher with the INSAM, which is the French National Institutes of Health in a department called Marseille Medical Genetics. I will present our laboratory's work on uh, congenital melanocytic nevi, which was funded in part through your support. Thanks to uh, a number of different patient associations around the world, we were able to publish three papers at the end of last year relevant to congenital melanocytic nevi. I will be concentrating in particular on this one, but I also want to say thank you for the opportunity to also present work on two other subjects that have to do with CMN. And I won't have time to get to those today, but I'm very happy to take questions and correspond later on by email. To understand congenital melanocytic nevi, we must understand the concept of mosaicism. What exactly is mosaicism? As you know, as cells divide, um, they make tissues grow by growing in numbers. And these cells can divide for a limited number of times, but there's quite a lot over the course of a lifetime. And they are identical to each other, but also to the cell from which they had come originally. And what can happen during development, but also throughout life, is that one of the cells is going to become different because it has acquired a DNA mutation uh, during the cell division process. And that will lead over time to all the cells that are descended from that original cell carrying the same DNA mutation, which is faithfully reproduced uh, during growth and development. And that, in a nutshell, is how you end up for example, with a congenital melanocytic nevus, but also a whole other wide variety of congenital uh, anomalies. We are finding more and more of them are uh, due to these, due to this kind of mosaicism. Now, from the very beginning of development, just after uh, fertilization and the first cell division, there are subtle differences that are going to start to accumulate in cells within your body. And these are called somatic mutations. Soma means body, and mutation means change. So imagine that a, a single cell has uh, acquired one of these somatic mutations. As that cell grows and uh, divides and occupies a progressively larger part of the body in the uh, developing embryo and fetus, and finally in the uh, mature postnatal body, then the, you can see how as nevi develop after birth, they grow proportionally with the body, but they stay within the cells that are descended from that original cell with the mutation. And this is how nevi develop in a nutshell. Now, a somatic mutation, any given somatic mutation, will be present in one single cell. And that mutation would then be transmitted to the future generations of related cells within that person's body. And so we call uh, all of us our mosaic. Now this is a little bit different from what happens with a hereditary mutation, what we call germline. Because if a mutation is present in the fertilized cell, as soon as it starts dividing, all the cells that are, that are in the embryo, in the organism, afterward are all going to carry that mutation all the way through life, through before and after birth. And that's in contrast with the congenital somatic mutation, which will give rise to a part of the body carrying that mutation and other parts of the body not carrying it. So I'm going to hammer this message home. The same molecular change can have very different effects on the body depending on when the first cell was mutated, was that before or after fertilization? And also, did it happen early on before birth, just before birth, or after birth? And the effects also depend on the competence of the cells to change their subsequent behavior. So a pigment cell that acquires a congenital somatic mutation appears to not behave in the same way as a pigment cell that acquires that exact same mutation in the DNA from sun exposure, for example, later in life. Now, some somatic mutations 
are not propagated in cells when they happen early on. They can lead either to embryonic, uh, embryonic mortality by some or too many of the cells carrying the mutation, for example, but if only a few of them carry, it's tolerated in the developing embryo. In particular, we see that extremely frequently uh, placentas are carrying somatic mutations. But what can also happen is that somatic mutation happened at a moment in time, and then later on in time, we see that the cells descended from the mutant cell are not actually viable. And so you can get depletion of those um, clones in what would have been a mosaic organism, and you would never know because all the cells are not carrying the mutation ultimately. Now that's a pretty simplified view. Now, it turns out that the two genes that to, at this point have been identified to be most commonly mutated in congenital melanocytic nevi are called NRAS and BRAF. And these are proteins that conduct signals from outside of the cell through uh, growth factor receptors. These are proteins that are embedded in cell membranes. And they conduct those signals to the inside of the cell and through a cascade of modifications from one enzyme to the next in a sequence of modifications known as the MAP kinase pathway, they will encourage either cell proliferation or cell differentiation depending on which cell has been stimulated and at what point in its life cycle it's going on. So normally during development and during life, all cells have lots of these growth factors receptors at their surface through which our cells interact with their environment or with their neighbors, with vitamins, with hormones, all sorts of things. And uh, that signal transduction through NRAS and BRAF is present, the machinery is present in all cells. The mutations that are often found in congenital melanocytic nevi, but also in postnatal somatic nevi, are uh, always this, or very often the same subset of mutations and they all lead to hyperactivity of the proteins that are encoded by those genes. Now, these, these changes, I said they're quite common, at least we find them somatically, but if an entire embryo is uh, mutated, that doesn't seem to be viable because we've never yet found a person with these extremely hyperactive causing mutations in NRAS or BRAF to date. And what we've also noticed is that when the entire head carries a somatic mutation in either NRAS or BRAF, we've also never seen someone with amoebas over their entire head and face. Um, it doesn't appear to be compatible with postnatal life. And for this reason, I need to change slides. For this reason, the congenital melanocytic nevus is never hereditary. It can't itself be transmitted from a parent because the nevus is not affecting the gonads, it's affecting the skin. Now, we can imagine a case where a, that, that would be the case here. You can't have the entire body uh, carrying the mutations that cause a CMN. However, imagine that a gonad had acquired a mutation later on in life in NRAS or BRAF and that the, um, the, the cells that give rise to the fertilized egg, one of those two cells is carrying the mutation. That's just going to lead to the same situation again, where in the progeny, all of the cells would carry the mutation, and therefore, this is not viable. Now, what we are very interested in is understanding those hereditary factors that might perhaps predispose to acquiring the mutations leading to common small CMN, which are quite frequent since they occur in more than one in 100 births and other types of mosaic congenital anomalies, because if you group them all together, this is quite a common mechanism. So we would like to know how somatic mutations are tolerated during development. And in our group in particular, we study how timing or the cell type that acquires a given somatic mutation in NRAS or BRAF, how these are going to affect the outcome in patients. And for that, we use animal models. Now, I've had the privilege over the last couple of years of volunteering and vice president of a nonprofit called the Association Anna. And Anna is a little girl who has a congenital melanocytic nevus on her face, but also with satellites on her body. And she lives a number of adventures and 
we have uh, developed this project, Marjolein von Kessel, who is the president of Nevis Global. This is the uh, association of all of the patient groups dedicated to CMN around the world, and it is a branch of Nevis International. Uh, she will explain more about that, and she's brought examples of our, our most recent comic book in which these scenes appear. So this comic book roughly translates to Steps Right Up, and Steps is an acronym for how to deal with how other people might look at you when you uh, appear different due to any kind of congenital anomaly, and gives you some tips on how to answer in a confident manner and feel good about yourself in any kind of social interaction. So at the end of the book, we thought it would be nice to include a few pages talking about how Nevi develop. And so this is uh, just a preview. We haven't yet translated it into English, but this gives you an idea. So um, here, Anna has just finished her visit with the doctor. And he says, so Anna, you're all good. We'll see you next year. But as they're on their way out, and this is often the case, Anna says, actually, I have a question. And how did I get a Nevis? Well, that's a big question. And so the doctor says, hey, that's a good question. Here, have a look over here. And he's going to illustrate this in a kind of a fantasy manner. Here we see a wall that's built, being built out of a number of bricks. And the doctor says there is a problem that had developed in the cells that color your skin. These are pigment cells. Now, what are cells after all? I mean, when you're a kid, you don't necessarily know. And so we explain that the cells are like microscopic bricks out of which the body is built. And inside of each of these cells, there are chromosomes, and these are just structures that are acting like DNA encyclopedias. DNA is a manner to transmit information, uh, the same information on how to make cells, and the chromosomes are simply volumes in which those instructions are organized and kept, and the cells can consult those volumes for how to make proteins and how to work and how to function. Now, as cells grow and divide, as I explained earlier, the text gets copied from one cell to the next, and then sometimes a change will slip in. And this change is known as a genetic mutation. So, you know, for those who want to get a little more into it, we try to put things that recall what you learned about DNA structure back in high school. And um, this essentially comes down to a, a, a very small typographic error that can get propagated from one cell to all of its progeny and really change the sense of the instructions for the cells. Now, of course, everybody asks this question sooner or later, why me or why my child? And in essence, if you take home any kind of message today, it's that the reason that we're not all clones and that we're not all identical is that we all have these different combinations of mutations in our cells. And even the cells in each of us are a little bit different from one another. But of course, they're much more similar to one another in our bodies than they are to any other person on Earth. So every living organism on Earth is both a mutant and a mosaic. So continuing on with this analogy, we're talking about how the cells in the body get made. Now, the mutations that are present in the nevus, NRAS or BRAF, uh, this was a little, a little wink at those of us who know about the pathway. Well, these mutations will cause more pigment cells to be uh, synthesized at the time when they're growing in the body, in the developing embryo. But that same mutation is, in, is not actually in most of the other cells. So when the cells are used to build the body, only some of them will have the mutation and not others. And so we all become mosaics. But the person with the CMN becomes visibly mosaic. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research that Nevis Outreach enabled, and I thank you very much for it. I did this uh, in conjunction with my PhD student, Pauline, who defended her thesis at the end of 2017. And uh, it was greatly thanks to Sven Krangel, who is a long-term friend of Nevis Outreach, uh, with whom we worked on this very interesting case report. Now, Sven had consulted with a gentleman uh, in his 70s, early 70s, I think, when he came to visit Sven, or maybe late 60s, who had a pretty typical congenital melanocytic nevus on his buttock and lower back with a single satellite here and another satellite up in the skull, on his, on his scalp. And they, they were fairly light. They didn't bother him very much. 
earlier on in life, he had tried to have um, an operation, but it went really badly. He bled so much during the operation that they had to give him a transfusion, and he's decided it really wasn't worth it. He was going to live with it. So as he got older, well, you know, accidents happen. Um, he came to Sven because he had been having some problems looking to, to supervise his nevus, and Sven had noticed at the time that he had developed over the nevus a kind of unusual malformation of the overlying skin to where usually nevi develop, called the epidermis. And these malformations are known as epidermal uh, cysts. And these cysts can get enormous in some people. And what they, they, they are basically uncontrolled prol proliferations, but kind of organized proliferations of the epidermis within which a bunch of gunk and keratin and stuff can accumulate. So, you know, when they get really big like this, they just get cut out by, by the surgeon. But, you know, Sven noticed that he had had quite a number of these smaller cysts and was wondering, is the discomfort of this patient, which the patient started to report, due to the cysts? Well, then the patient fell down. I don't remember if he fell on the stairs or what, but he fell on his bottom. And then he was in agony for a little while. And then he had flare-ups every month or so, in particular if he sat in the car too long and traveled. And this got to be really uncomfortable for him. So to radiology and imaging showed, this is a cross-section th through about this level. First, we could see the thickening of the skin at the level of the giant nevus itself, but also this large mass here which corresponds to a vascular malformation right under the nevus within the buttock. And uh, further imaging showed that that vascular malformation had the typical slow blood flow of a venous malformation. So the blood pools in the malformation, and this sort of growth of the blood vessels is something that the gentleman had had since he was born, just like the nevus, and just under the nevus. And in fact, it had never been aggravated except potentially when he had been operated, you know, 10 years earlier, and it basically just didn't bother him until he fell on it. And that's kind of typical of vascular malformations is that um, we don't really know what makes them start to become symptomatic and develop. Um, but this blood flow, which was slow, is a little bit different than arteriovenous malformations, which tend to be fast flow and pulsatile, and they start to destruct destroying the tissue in which they appear if they start to become symptomatic and painful like this. So it turns out this gentleman's symptoms could be controlled by ice, good news for him. And we were very interested by the association of these three previously non-associated symptoms all in the same person. So he, the, this, this man consented to have a biopsy, both from the nevus, this was taken at the time he had been operated, but also from his uh, scalp uh, satellite nevus, and we were able to confirm the presence of BRAF mutations, which is the minority gene in most CMN, both in both of those two biopsies, which tends to suggest that they come from the same original single cell that had been mutated, of which progeny went off to be in the scalp and went off to be also in the bottom, which is quite extraordinary when you think about it. Now, in any given nevus, only the pigment cells are going to have a mutation, this is what we call a gain of function mutation. And that mutation is going to change the cellular behavior to restructure the surrounding tissues, both the skin itself uh, at the level of the hair follicles, but also in this case, we're wondering if that isn't responsible for restructuring the blood vessels underneath. Since usually, at least in the bottom, this is not the case in the head, the blood vessels have a very distinct, different embryonic origin from uh, pigment cells. Now, a typical change in BRAF DNA is going, which is, which is depicted here, the sequence of the DNA of this little portion of the BRAF gene will correspond to an amino acid sequence of the ultimate protein that's made. And in the blood of this gentleman, the two copies of the gene, the one that he got from his mom and the one that he got from his dad, are identical because usually the, this gene is, is never changing from one person to another in this particular area of it because to change it will change its function in a very dramatic manner. And in the two nevi, what we observe is a very stereotypical change that happens and that we find 
in one of the two copies, be it from the mom or the dad, it doesn't really matter. Um, at least that's how it, it usually looks when it's when we're talking about a hereditary um, mutation. In this case, it's one of the two copies changed in the, an original cell in this gentleman, and he no longer had the same uh, sequence as the copy that his mom or his dad had originally given to him in that cell. So he acquired a mutation, which then changes the amino acid sequence of the BRF protein and changes its function. And we presume it's the same in the underlying vascular malformation, but that's not something we were able to confirm because we didn't have access to a biopsy of the malformation since we didn't want to cause any more trouble to this gentleman, any more problems of transfusion or anything like that. What's interesting is this, this particular BRAF mutation is a very typical mutation that is often found acquired in postnatal cancers of all kinds, melanoma, but also pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, a whole bunch of different kinds of cancers. But this man had no cancer. He had two kinds of usually distinct congenital malformations, one right on top of the other. Now, recently it has been shown that somatic mutations in the BRAF gene are also present in other congenital anomalies. So uh, Miguel Reis Mugica and his group have shown that BRAF mutations uh, are present in all sorts of giant congenital melanocytic nevi and their complications, but uh, the same exact mutation can give rise to something known as a pyogenic granuloma, which is a benign capillary tumor that doesn't, didn't really attract people's attention because it didn't cause problems aside from aesthetic problems. However, there was a recent report of an association in the same child of three different kinds of malformations in the eye, in the epidermis of the skin at the level of the sebaceous glands in which these benign tumors form in clones of cells carrying that mutation, and in this child as well, a very rare brain cancer. Um, at last report, the child was doing well after surgery. And in the group of Veronica Kinsler recently, they reported uh, this particular patient who also had an arteriovenous malformation, but not a congenital melanocytic nevus, due to a mutation in BRAF. So this is the very first time that our, our two reports show that BRAF mutations can cause major vascular malformations that are come about during embryonic and fetal development and can go unsymptomatic for many years before being aggravated later in life and showing up. So this is that same schematic, a little bit more complicated, again with the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. Our lab is studying how BRAF, which is here in this cascade of, of, of uh, enzymes that modify one another, we study how it, but also other related proteins like NRAS and like this protein I haven't mentioned before, uh, PI3 kinase, which is just under the membrane here, how they both influence intracellular signaling to tell the cells to proliferate or to differentiate, that is to become uh, different new kinds of cells, but also to change fates and acquire uh, inappropriate behaviors for the developing environment. So we continue to be interested in this work and uh, hope to have some really exciting things to tell you about in, at the next conference. Um, now what's also very exciting is because of the prevalence of mutations in these proteins in cancers, there are a number of chemical inhibitors that are being developed and tested in clinical trials to help address uh, the symptomology or some of the more problematic complications of congenital melanocytic nevi. So there's a lot of hope in the future from this kind of basic research. I would like to thank the team in which I work, which is directed by Stéphane Zaffron, my former PhD student, Pauline He, who is now uh, doing a postdoc in a related congenital uh, rare disease known as Costello syndrome. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the physicians who work with us, and our, in particular, our collaborators, uh, especially Sven Krangel. And finally, our um, patient group, funders without whom none of this work would have happened. Thank you very much for your attention.